Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all, thank you all, thank you, and hello New York, hello New York, and thank you, yeah, okay, it's been a little while, it's been a little while since I've been here, and a couple of things have happened in that time, I'd like to talk a little bit about the war in the Persian Gulf, Big doings in the Persian Gulf. You know my favorite part of that war? It's the first war we ever had that was on every channel plus cable. <laughs> and the war got good ratings too, didn't it? Got good ratings. Well, we like war. We like war. We're a warlike people. We like war because we're good at it. And you know why we're good at it? Because we get a lot of practice. This country's only 200 years old and already we've had 10 major wars. We average a major war every 20 years in this country, so we're good at it. And it's a good thing we are. We're not very good at anything else anymore. Huh? Can't build a decent car. Can't make a TV set or a VCR worth the fuck. Got no steel industry left. Can't educate our young people. Can't get health care to our old people. But we can bomb the shit out of your country, all right? Huh? We can bomb the shit out of your country, all right? Especially if your country is full of brown people. Oh, we like that, don't we? That's our hobby. That's our new job in the world, bombing brown people. Iraq, Panama, Grenada, Libya, you got some brown people in your country, tell them to watch the fuck out or we'll goddamn bomb them. Well, when's the last white people you can remember that we bombed? Can you remember the last white, can you remember any white people? we've ever bombed. The Germans, those are the only ones. And that's only because they were trying to cut in on our action. They wanted to dominate the world. Bullshit, that's our fucking job. That's our fucking job. Now we only bomb brown people. Not because they're trying to cut in on our action, just because they're brown. Now, you probably noticed I don't feel about that war the way we were told we were supposed to feel about that war, the way we were ordered and instructed by the United States government to feel about that war. You see, I'll tell you, my mind doesn't work that way. I got this real moron thing I do. It's called thinking. And I'm not a very good American because I like to form my own opinions. I don't just roll over when I'm told to. Sad to say, most Americans just roll over on command, not me. I have certain rules I live by. My first rule, I don't believe anything the government tells me. Nothing. Zero. Nope. And I don't take very seriously the media or the press in this country, who in the case of the Persian Gulf War were nothing more than unpaid employees of the Department of Defense, and who most of the time, most of the time, function as kind of an unofficial public relations agency for the United States government. So I don't listen to them, I don't really believe in my country, and I gotta tell you folks, I don't get all choked up about yellow ribbons and American flags. I consider them, I consider them to be symbols, and I leave symbols to the symbol-minded. Me, I look at war a little bit differently. To me, war is a lot of prick-waving, okay? Simple thing, that's all it is. War is a whole lot of men standing out in the field waving their pricks at one another. Men are insecure about the size of their dicks and so they have to kill one another over the idea. That's what all that asshole jock bullshit is all about. That's what all that adolescent macho male posturing and strutting in bars and locker rooms is all about. It's called dick fear. <laughs> Men are terrified that their pricks are inadequate and so they have to compete with one another to feel better about themselves. And since war is the ultimate competition, basically men are killing each other in order to improve their self-esteem. 
You don't have to be a historian or a political scientist to see the bigger dick foreign policy theory at work. It sounds like this. What? They have bigger dicks? Bomb them! And of course, the bombs and the rockets and the bullets are all shaped like dicks. It's a subconscious need to project the penis into other people's affairs. It's called fucking with people. So, so, as far as I'm concerned, that whole thing in the Persian Gulf was nothing more than a big prick-waving dick fight. In this particular case, Saddam Hussein had questioned the size of George Bush's dick. And George Bush had been called a wimp for so long, Wimp rhymes with limp. George has been called a wimp for so long that he has to act out his manhood fantasies by sending other people's children to die. Even the name Bush. Even the name Bush is related to the genitals without being the genitals. A Bush is a sort of passive secondary sex characteristic. Now, if this man's name had been George Boner, well, he might have felt a little bit better about himself and we wouldn't have had any trouble over there in the first place. This whole country has a manhood problem, big manhood problem in the USA. You can tell from the language we use. Language always gives you away. What did we do wrong in Vietnam? We pulled out. <laughs> ah, not a very manly thing to do, is it? When you're fucking people, you gotta stay in there and fuck them good. Fuck them all the way. Fuck them to the end. Fuck them to death. Fuck them to death. Fuck them to death. Stay in there and keep fucking them until they're all dead. We left a few women and children alive in Vietnam and we haven't felt good about ourselves since. That's why in the Persian Gulf, George Bush had to say, this will not be another Vietnam. He actually used these words. He said, this time we're going all the way. <laughs> Imagine an American president using the sexual slang of a 13-year-old to describe his foreign policy. <laughs> if you want to know what happened in the Persian Gulf, just remember the names of the two men who were running that war, Dick Cheney and Colin Powell. <laughs> Somebody got fucked in the ass. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, tell you what. Now, to balance the scale, I'd like to talk about some things that bring us together. Things that point out our similarities instead of our differences. Because that's all you ever hear about in this country is our differences. That's all the media and the politicians are ever talking about, the things that separate us, things that make us different from one another. That's the way the ruling class operates in any society. They try to divide the rest of the people. They keep the lower and the middle classes fighting with each other so that they, the rich, can run off with all the fucking money. <laughs> Fairly simple thing happens to work. You know, anything different, that's what they're going to talk about. Race, religion, ethnic and national background, jobs, income, education, social status, sexuality, anything you can do, keep us fighting with each other so that they can keep going to the bank. You know how I describe the economic and social classes in this country? The upper class keeps all of the money, pays none of the taxes. The middle class pays all of the taxes, does all of the work. The poor are there just to scare the shit out of the middle class. <laughs> Keep them showing up at those jobs. So, so stirring up the shit is something I like to do from time to time, but I also like to know that I can come back to these little things we have in common, little universal moments that we share separately, the things that make us the same. They're so small we hardly ever talk about them. Did you ever look at your watch and then you don't know what time it is? And you have to look again. And you still don't know the time. So you look a third time and somebody says, what time is it? You say, I don't know. <laughs> Do you ever notice how sometimes all day Wednesday, you keep thinking it's Thursday? <laughs> and it happens over and over all day long. And then the next day, you're all right again. <laughs> Do you ever find yourself standing in one of the rooms in your house 
And you can't remember why you went in there? And two words float across your mind, Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> you ever been talking to yourself and somebody comes in the room and you have to make believe you are singing? <laughs> and you hope to God the other person really believes there's a song called What Does She Think I Am? Some Kind of Putz? <laughs> Little experiences we've all had. You ever been sitting in a railroad train in a station and there's another train sitting right next to you and one of them starts to move and you can't tell which one it is? <laughs> How about when you're out on a small boat on a windy day? You ever been out rocking back and forth for three or four hours trying to keep your balance, rough seas, little boat, then you get back into the shore and you're standing on the dock and you can swear there was something inside of you that was still out there rocking. <laughs> Did you ever try to pick up a suitcase you thought was full but it wasn't? And you go, Doo. and for just a split second, you feel really strong. <laughs> How about when you're looking through a chain link fence? Do you ever notice if you're just the right distance from a chain link fence, sometimes it seems to go, Doo. what is that? How do they do that? Do you ever try to tell somebody they have a little bit of dirt on their face? You can never get them to rub the right spot, can you? <laughs> Say, you got a little bit of dirt right here. They always go, we're here! <laughs> and you just want to slap the bastard. Do you ever notice how awful your face looks in a mirror in a restroom that has fluorescent lights? <laughs> Every cut, scrape, scratch, scar, scab, bruise, boil, bump, pimple, zip, wart, welt, and abscess you've had since birth. All seem to come back at the same time. And all you can think of is, I gotta get the fuck out of here! <laughs> Do you ever notice sometimes when you're walking with your arm around your date, one of you has to change the way you're walking. <laughs> Men and women don't walk the same. One of them has to change. Either the man has to walk like this. <laughs> or the woman has to walk like this. <laughs> Joey, how are you? How about when you're going up a flight of stairs and you think there's one more step? <laughs> and you go... <laughs> and then you have to kind of keep doing that, you know? So people will think it's something you do all the time. I do this all the time. It's the third stage of syphilis. <laughs> Same thing happens when you're going down the stairs. You could swear there was one more step. <laughs> Holy shit. My hips are in my chest. <laughs> when you drink grapefruit juice in the morning, do you go like this? <laughs> I do too. Why do we drink it? It's like ice cream throat. You know when you've been eating ice cream too fast and you get that frozen spot in the back of your throat, but you can't do anything about it because you can't reach it to rub it? You just have to kind of wait for it to go away. And it does. Then what do you do? Eat more ice cream. What are we fucking stupid? Do you ever fall asleep on a late afternoon and wake up after dark and you don't know what goddamn day it is? <laughs> like when you have your head on the pillow. Do you ever notice when you have your head on the pillow, if you close the, if you close the bottom eye, the pillow is down there. <laughs> then if you switch eyes, the pillow moves up there. Whoa, holy shit, Dave, look at this. The mystery of the moving pillow. 
I think it's related to the chain link fence mystery myself. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have to sneeze while you're taking a piss? It's frightening, isn't it? It's frightening because actually you can't do it. It's physically impossible to sneeze while pissing. Your brain won't let it happen. Your brain says, stop pissing! We're going to sneeze now! Because your brain knows you might blow your asshole out. Something else we have in common, flying on the airlines and listening to the airlines announcements and trying to pretend to ourselves that the language they're using is really English. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it to me. Whole thing starts when you get to the gate. First announcement. We would like to begin the boarding process. <laughs> Extra word, process, not necessary. Boarding is enough. We'd like to begin the boarding. Simple, tells the story. People add extra words when they want things to sound more important than they really are. Boarding process, sounds important. It isn't. <laughs> it's just a bunch of people getting on an airplane. People like to sound important. Weathermen on television talk about shower activity. <laughs> sounds more important than showers. I even heard one guy on CNN talk about a rain event. I swear to God. He said, Louisiana's expecting a rain event. I thought, holy shit, I hope I can get tickets to that. <laughs> emergency situation. News people like to say, police have responded to an emergency situation. No, they haven't. They've responded to an emergency. We know it's a situation. <laughs> Everything is a situation. Anyway, as part of this boarding process, they say, we would like to pre-board. Well, what exactly is that, anyway? What does it mean to pre-board? You get on before you get on? That's another complaint of mine. Too much use of this prefix pre. It's all over the language now. Pre this, pre that. Place the turkey in a preheated oven. It's ridiculous. There are only two states an oven can possibly exist in, heated or unheated. Preheated is a meaningless fucking term. It's like pre-recorded. This program was pre-recorded. Well, of course it was pre-recorded. When else are you going to record it? Afterwards? <laughs> That's the whole purpose of recording, to do it beforehand. Otherwise, it doesn't really work, does it? <laughs> pre-existing, pre-planning, pre-screening. You know what I tell these people? Pre-suck my genital situation. <laughs> And they seem to understand what I'm talking about. Anyway, as part of this pre-boarding, they say, we would like to pre-board those passengers traveling with small children. Well, what about those passengers traveling with large children? <laughs> Suppose you have a two-year-old with a pituitary disorder. <laughs> you know, a six-foot infant with an oversized head. <laughs> kind of kid you see in the National Enquirer all the time. Actually, with a kid like that, I think you're better off checking him right in with your luggage at the curb, don't you? Well, they like it under there. It's dark. They're used to that. <laughs> About this time, someone is telling you to get on the plane. Get on the plane. Get on the plane. I say, fuck you. I'm getting in the plane. <laughs> in the plane. <laughs> Let evil Knievel get on the plane. <laughs> I'll be in here with you folks in uniform. There seems to be less wind in here. They might tell you you're on a non-stop flight. <laughs> well, I don't think I care for that. No, I insist that my flight stop. <laughs> Preferably at an airport. It's those sudden unscheduled cornfield and housing development stops <laughs> that seem to interrupt the flow of my day. Here's one they just made up. Near miss. When two planes almost collide, they call it a near miss. It's a near hit. A collision is a near miss. <laughs> Look, they nearly miss.
Yes, but not quite. They might tell you your flight has been delayed because of a change of equipment. Broken plane. <laughs> tell me to put my seat back forward. <laughs> well, I don't bend that way. If I could put my seat back forward, I'd be in porno movies. <laughs> then they mentioned carry-on luggage. First time I heard carry-on, I thought they were going to bring a dead deer on board. I thought, what the hell do they mean with that? Don't they have the little TV dinners anymore? Then I thought, carry on, carry on. There's going to be a party. People are going to be carrying on on the plane. <laughs> well, I don't care for that. I like a serious attitude on the plane, especially on the flight deck, which is the latest euphemism for cockpit. <laughs> Can't imagine why they wouldn't want to use a lovely word like cockpit, can you? <laughs> especially with all those stewardesses going in and out of it all the time. <laughs> There's one. There's a word that's changed, stewardess. First it was hostess, then stewardess, now it's flight attendant. You know what I call them? The lady on the plane. <laughs> Sometimes it's a man on the plane now. That's good, equality. I'm all in favor of that. Sometimes they actually refer to these people as uniformed crew members. Uniformed. As opposed to that guy sitting next to you in the Grateful Dead t-shirt and the fuck you hat. <laughs> who's working on his ninth little bottle of Kahlua, I might add. <laughs> as soon as they close the door to the aircraft, that's when they begin the safety lecture. I love the safety lecture. This is my favorite part of the airplane ride. I listen very carefully to the safety lecture, especially that part where they teach us how to use the seat belts. <laughs> Imagine this, here we are, a plane full of grown human beings, many of us partially educated, and they're actually taking time out to describe the intricate workings of a belt buckle. Place the small metal flap into the buckle. Well, I ask for clarification at that point. <laughs> Over here, please. Over here. Yes, thank you very much. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say place the small metal flap into the buckle or place the buckle over and around the small metal flap. I'm a simple man. I do not possess an engineering degree, nor am I mechanically inclined. Sorry to have taken up so much of your time. Please continue with the wonderful safety lecture. Seatbelt. High-tech shit. The safety lecture continues. The next thing they do, they tell you to locate your nearest emergency exit. I do this immediately. I locate my nearest emergency exit, and then I plan my route. You have to plan your route. It's not always a straight line, is it? Sometimes there's a really big fat fuck sitting right in front of you. Well, you know you'll never get over him. I look around for women and children, midgets and dwarfs, cripples, war widows, paralyzed veterans, people with broken legs, anybody who looks like they can't move too well. The emotionally disturbed come in very handy at a time like this. You might have to go out of your way to find these people, but you'll get out of the plane a lot goddamn quicker, believe me. I say, let's see. I'll go around the fat fuck, step on the widow's head, push those children out of the way, knock down the paralyzed midget, and get out of the plane where I can help others. I can be of no help to anyone if I'm lying unconscious in the aisle with some big cocksucker standing on my head. I must get out of the plane, go to a nearby farmhouse, have a Dr. Pepper, and call the police. The safety lecture continues. In the unlikely event... This is a very suspect phrase. Especially coming as it does from an industry that is willing to lie about arrival and departure times. In the unlikely event of a sudden change in cabin pressure, roof flies off. <laughs> An oxygen mask will drop down in front of you. Place the mask over your face and breathe normally. Well, I have no problem with that. I always breathe normally when I'm in a 600 mile an hour uncontrolled vertical dive. 
I also shit normally. <laughs> right in my pants! <laughs> they tell you to adjust your oxygen mask before helping your child with his. I did not need to be told that. <laughs> in fact, I'm probably going to be too busy screaming to help him at all. <laughs> this will be a good time for him to learn self-reliance. <laughs> If he can program his fucking VCR, he can goddamn jolly well learn to adjust an oxygen mask. Fairly simple thing, just a little rubber band in the back is all it is. Not nearly as complicated as, say, for instance, a seatbelt. The safety lecture continues. In the unlikely event of a water landing, Well, what exactly is a water landing? Am I mistaken, or does this sound somewhat similar to crashing into the ocean? <laughs> Your seat cushion can be used as a flotation device. Well, imagine that. My seat cushion. Just what I need to float around the North Atlantic for several days. Clinging to a pillow full of beer farts. Thank you. Thank you. The flight continues. A little later on, toward the end, we hear the captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign. Well, who gives a shit who turned it on? What does that have to do with anything? It's on, isn't it? And who made this man a captain? Might I ask? Did I sleep through some sort of an armed forces swearing in ceremony or something? Captain, he's a fucking pilot and let him be happy with that. If those sightseeing announcements are any mark of his intellect, he's lucky to be working at all. Tell the captain, Air Marshal Carlin says, go fuck yourself. <laughs> the next sentence I hear is full of things that piss me off. Before leaving the aircraft, please check around your immediate seating area for any personal belongings you might have brought on board. Well, let's start with immediate seating area. <laughs> seat! It's a goddamn seat! Check around your seat. For any personal belongings. Well, what other kinds of belongings are there? Besides personal. Public belongings? Do these people honestly think I might be traveling with a fountain I stole from the park? You might have brought on board. Well, I might have brought my arrowhead collection. I didn't. So I'm not going to look for it. I'm going to look for things I brought on board. Would seem to enhance the likelihood of my finding something, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Telling me to return my seat back and tray table to their original upright positions? Fine. Who's going to return this guy in the Grateful Dead t-shirt and the fuck you had to his original upright position? <laughs> About this time, they tell you you'll be landing shortly. That sound to you like we're going to miss the runway? Final approach is not very promising either, is it? Final is not a good word to be using on an airplane. Sometimes the pilot will get on, you'll say, we'll be on the ground in 15 minutes. Well, that's a little vague, isn't it? <laughs> now we're taxiing in. She says, welcome to O'Hare International Airport. Well, how can someone who is just arriving herself possibly welcome me to a place she isn't even at yet. Doesn't this, 
Doesn't this violate some fundamental law of physics? We're only on the ground for a second. She's coming on like a fucking mayor's wife. We're the local time. Well, of course it's the local time. What did you think we were expecting? The time in Pango Pango? Enjoy your stay in Chicago or wherever your final destination might be. All destinations are final. That's what it means. Destiny, final. If you haven't gotten where you're going, you aren't there yet. <laughs> the captain has asked... More shit from the bogus captain. <laughs> you know, for someone who's supposed to be flying an airplane, he's taking a mighty big interest in what I'm doing back here. That you remain seated until he has brought the aircraft to a complete stop. Not a partial stop. Because during a partial stop, I partially get up. Continue to observe the no smoking sign until well inside the terminal. It's physically impossible to observe the no smoking sign even if you're standing just outside the door of the airplane. Much less well inside the terminal. You can't even see the fucking planes from well inside the terminal. Which brings me to terminal. Another unfortunate word to be used in association with air travel. And they use it all over the airport, don't they? Somehow I just can't get hungry at a place called the Terminal Snack Bar. But if you've ever eaten there, you know it is an appropriate name. Now, speaking of places to eat, places to eat and what they're called or named, Beverly Hills has a brand new restaurant specifically for bulimia victims. It's called the Scarf and Barf. Well, they were going to call it the Fork and Bucket. Thank God good taste prevailed. How about a restaurant for anorexics? What would you call it? The Empty Plate. The Lonesome Chef. Start without me, guys. See, somehow I can't feel sorry for an anorexic, you know? Rich cunt, don't want to eat? Fucker. <laughs> Fuck. Don't eat. I give a shit. Like, I'm supposed to be concerned about this. I don't want to eat! Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Why don't you lie down in front of a railroad train right after you don't eat? What kind of a goddamn disease is that, anyway? I don't want to eat! How do we come up with this shit in this country? Where do we get our values from? Bulimia, there's another all-American disease. This has got to be the only country in the world that could ever have come up with bulimia. Got to be the only country where some people are digging in the dumpster for a peach pit, other people eat a nice meal and puke it up intentionally. Where do we get our values from? I do not understand our values. By the way, speaking of American values, aren't we about due to start bombing some small country that only has a marginally effective air force? Seems to me like we're weeks overdue to drop high explosives on helpless civilians. People who have no argument with us whatsoever. I think we ought to be out there doing what we do best, gang, making large holes in other people's countries. I hate to be repetitious, but we are a warlike lot. We can't stand it not to be fucking with somebody. We couldn't wait for that Cold War to be over, could we? Couldn't wait for the Cold War to be over so we can go and play with our toys in the sand. Go and play with our toys in the sand. And when we're not invading some sovereign nation or setting it on fire from the air, which is more fun for our Nintendo pilots, then... <laughs> Then we're usually declaring war on something here at home. Did you ever notice that about us? We love to declare war on things here in America. Anything we don't like about ourselves, we declare war on it. We don't do anything about it. We just declare war on it. It's the only metaphor, the only metaphor we have in our public discourse for solving problems, declaring war. We have to declare a war on everything. We have a war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on litter, the war on cancer, the war on drugs. 
But you ever notice, we got no war on homelessness, huh? No war on homelessness, you know why? There's no money in that problem. No money to be made off of the homeless. If you could find a solution, if you could find a solution to homelessness where the corporate swine and the politicians could steal a couple of million dollars each, you'd see the streets of America begin to clear up pretty goddamn quick. I'll guarantee you that. I will guarantee you that. Yeah. I got it. I got an idea. You know what they ought to do? Give the homeless their own magazine. Give them their own magazine. It would make them feel better for one thing. That's a sure sign of making it in this country. Every group in this country that arrives at a certain level has its own magazine. We have Working Mother Magazine, Black Entrepreneur Magazine, Hispanic Business Magazine. In fact, any activity, any activity engaged in by more than four people in this country has got a fucking magazine devoted to it. <laughs> Skydiving, snowmobiling, backpacking, mountain climbing, bungee jumping. Skeet shooting, duck hunting, jerking off, playing pool, shooting someone in the asshole with a dart gun. They probably got a fucking magazine for that. Walking, for Christ's sakes, walking! There's actually a fucking magazine called Walking. Look, Dan, the new walking is out. Here's a good article, putting one foot in front of the other. Give their own magazine. Give them their own magazine. You know what you call the magazine for the homeless? Better crates and cartons. Yeah, then when they can finish reading it, they can use it to line their clothing. That's a good sound business solution, isn't it? That's the kind of answer you get from a conservative American businessman in this country. Say, yeah, let them read it. When they get finished reading it, they can use it to plug up the holes in them piano crates they all seem to like to live in. A good sound, practical, conservative American business solution. I got an idea about homelessness. You know what they ought to do? Change the name of it. Change the name of it. It's not homelessness. It's houselessness. It's houses these people need. A home is an abstract idea. A home is a setting. It's a state of mind. These people need houses. Physical, tangible structures. They need low-cost housing. But where are you going to put it? Well, that's fine, but where are you going to put it? Where are you going to put it? Nobody wants you to build low-cost housing near their house. People don't want it near them. We got something in this country, you've heard of it, it's called NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y. Not in my backyard. <laughs> People don't want anything, any kind of social help located anywhere near them. You try to open up a halfway house, try to open up a drug rehab or an alcohol rehab center, try to do a homeless shelter somewhere, try to open up a little home for some retarded people who want to work their way into the community. People say, not in my backyard. People don't want anything near them, especially if it might help somebody else. Part of that great American spirit of generosity we hear about. <laughs> great, generous American spirit. You can ask an Indian about that. Ask an Indian about if you can find one. You've got to locate an Indian first. We've made him just a little difficult to find. Well, if you need current data, select a black family at random. Ask them how generous America has been to them. People don't want anything near them, even if it's something they believe in, something they think society needs, like prisons. Everybody wants more prisons, right? Everybody wants more prisons. People say, build more prisons! But not here. <laughs> but why not? What's wrong? What's the problem? What's wrong with having a prison in your neighborhood? It well, seemed to me like it would make it a pretty crime-free area, don't you think? You think a lot of crackheads and pimps and hookers and thieves are going to be hanging around in front of a fucking prison? <laughs> Bullshit, they ain't coming anywhere near it. What's wrong with these people? All the criminals are locked up behind the walls, and if a couple of them do break out, what do you think they're going to do? Hang around? <laughs> Check real estate trends? Bullshit, <laughs> they're fucking gone. That's the whole idea of breaking out of prison, is to get the fuck as far away as you possibly can. <laughs> Not in my backyard. People don't want anything near them, except military bases. They don't mind that, do they? They like that. Give them an army base, give them a navy base, makes them happy. Why? Jobs. Jobs. Self-interest. Even if the base is loaded with nuclear weapons, they don't give a fuck. They say, well, I'll take a little radiation if I can get a job. <laughs> Working people have been fucked over so long in this country, those are the kind of decisions they're left to make. I've got just the place for low-cost housing. I have solved this problem. I know where we can build housing for the homeless. Golf courses. Perfect. Golf courses. Just what we need. 
just what we need. Plenty of good land in nice neighborhoods, land that is currently being wasted on a meaningless, mindless activity engaged in, engaged in primarily by white, well-to-do male businessmen who use the game to get together to make deals to carve this country up a little finer among themselves. I am getting tired, really getting tired of these golfing cocksuckers in their green pants and their yellow pants and their orange pants and their precious little hats and their cute little golf carts. It is time to reclaim the golf courses from the wealthy and turn them over to the homeless. Golf is an arrogant, elitist game and it takes up entirely too much room in this country. Too much room in this country. It is, it is an arrogant game on its very design alone. Just the design of the game speaks of arrogance. Think of how big a golf course is. The ball is that fucking big. What do these pinheaded pricks need with all that land? There are over 17,000 golf courses in America. They average over 150 acres apiece. That's 3 million plus acres. 4,820 square miles. You could build two Rhode Islands and a Delaware for the homeless on the land currently being wasted on this meaningless, mindless, arrogant, elitist, racist, there's another thing, the only blacks you'll find in country clubs are carrying trays, and a boring game, boring game for boring people. You ever watch golf on television? It's like watching flies fuck. And, and a mindless game, mindless. Think of the intellect it must take to draw pleasure from this activity. Hitting a ball with a crooked stick and then, walking after it. And then, hitting it again. I say, pick it up, asshole. You're lucky you found the fucking thing. Put it in your pocket and go the fuck home. You're a winner. You're a winner. You found it. No. Never happened. No. No chance of that happening. Dorco in the plaid knickers is gonna hit it again and walk some more. Let these rich cocksuckers play miniature golf. Let them fuck with a windmill for an hour and a half or so. See if there's really any skill among these people. Now, I know there are some people who play golf who don't consider themselves rich. Fuck them! And shame on them for engaging in an arrogant, elitist pastime. Hey, here's another place we could put some low-cost housing. Cemeteries! There's another idea whose time has passed. Saving all the dead people and for one part of town? What the hell kind of a medieval superstitious religious bullshit idea is that? Plow these motherfuckers up, plow them into the streams and rivers of America. We need that phosphorus for farming. If we're going to recycle, let's get serious. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Good to have a little sip of this. The water, I assume, is still safe to drink in New York, huh? Actually, actually, I gotta be fair with you. I'm only setting you up a little bit. It's just a, a not a trick question, but it's just a setup because I don't really care about the water, to tell you the truth. I just love to hear the answer to that question. I ask that question everywhere I go. Everywhere I go, I say, how's the water? Haven't gotten a positive answer yet. Not one. Last year I was in 40 states, 100 cities. Not one audience was able to say to me, yes, enjoy some of our fine local water. <laughs> it is pure and it is good. Of course, I know a lot of people don't talk that way anymore, but nobody trusts the local water supply. Nobody. And that amuses me. I like that. I admit I'm a bit perverted. But it amuses me that no one can really trust the water anymore. And the thing I like about it the most is it means the system is beginning to collapse and everything is slowly breaking down. I enjoy chaos and disorder. Not just because they help me professionally. Uh, they're also my hobby. You see, I'm an entropy fan. I'm an entropy fan. When I first heard of entropy in high school science, I was attracted to it immediately. 
When they told me that in nature, all systems are breaking down, I thought, what a good thing. What a good thing. Perhaps I can make some small contribution in this area myself. <laughs> and of course, it's not just in nature. In this country, the whole social structure just beginning to collapse. You watch. Just beginning now to come apart at the edges and the seams. And the thing I like about that is that it means it makes the news on television more interesting, makes the television news more exciting, makes it more fun. I watch television news for one thing and one thing only, entertainment. That's all I want from the news, entertainment. You know my favorite thing on television? Bad news. Bad news and disasters and accidents and catastrophes. I want to see some explosions and fires. I want to see shit blowing up and bodies flying around. I'm not interested in the budget. I don't care about tax negotiations. I don't want to know what country the fucking Pope is in. But you show me a hospital that's on fire and people on crutches are jumping off the roof and I'm a happy guy! I'm a happy guy! I'm a happy guy! I want to see a paint factory blowing up. I want to see an oil refinery explode. I want to see a tornado hit a church on Sunday. I want to see people... I want to know there's some guy running through the Kmart with an automatic weapon firing at the clerks. I want to see thousands of people in the street killing policemen. I want to hear about a nuclear meltdown. I want to know the stock market dropped 2,000 points in one day. I want to see people under pressure. Sirens, flames, smoke, bodies, graves being filled, parents weeping, exciting shit. My kind of TV. I just want some entertainment. It's just the kind of guy I am. It's the kind of guy I am. You know what I love the most? When big chunks of concrete and fiery wood are falling out of the sky and people are running around trying to get out of the way. <laughs> Exciting shit. That's why I watch auto racing. That's the only reason I watch auto racing. I'm waiting for some accidents, man. I want to see some cars on fire. I don't care about a bunch of redneck jack-offs driving 500 miles in a circle. 500 miles in a circle? Children can do that, for Christ's sakes. Doesn't impress me. I want to see some schmuck with his hair on fire running around punching his own head, trying to put it out. I want to see the pits explode. I want to see a car doing a 200 mile an hour cartwheel. Hey, where else besides auto racing am I going to see a 23 car collision and not be in this son of a bitch? <laughs> and if a car flies out of control, lands in the stands and kills 50 spectators, fine, fuck them. Serves them right. They paid to get in, let them take their chances with everybody else. Just means more fun for me. More fun for me. Hey, at least I admit it. At least I admit it. Most people won't admit to those feelings. Most people see something like that on television, they'll say, oh, isn't that awful? Isn't that too bad? <laughs> Lying asshole. <laughs> Lying assholes. <laughs> you love it and you know it. Explosions are fun. And hey, the closer the explosion is to your house, the more fun it is. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? Sometimes you have the TV on and you're working around the house. Some guy comes on television and says, 6,000 people were killed in an explosion today. You say, where, where? He says, in Pakistan. You say, oh, fuck Pakistan. <laughs> Too far away to be any fun. But if he says it happened in your hometown, you'll say, whoa, hot shit. Come on, Dave, let's go look at the bodies. Let's go look at the bodies. I love bad news. I love bad news. Hey, the more bad news there is, the faster this system collapses. Fine by me, fine by me. Don't bother my ass. Don't bother my ass, none. I'm glad the water sucks. I'm glad it sucks. You know what I do about it? I drink it. <laughs> ah. Unless, unless it really smells, if it really smells a lot like sulfur, then I might buy a soda. <laughs> but it's got to be a soda loaded with chemical additives. I like a lot of chemical additives in the things I eat and drink. See, I'm not one of these people who's worried about everything. You got people like this around you, country's full of them now. People walking around all day long, every minute of the day, worried about everything. Worried about the air, worried about the water, worried about the soil. Worried about insecticides, pesticides, food additives, carcinogens. Worried about radon gas, worried about asbestos. Worried about saving endangered species. Let me tell you about endangered species, all right? Saving endangered species is just one more arrogant attempt by humans to control nature. It's arrogant meddling. It's what got us in trouble in the first place. Doesn't anybody understand that? Interfering with nature. Over 90%, over, way over, 90% of all the species that have ever lived on this planet, ever lived, are gone. They're extinct. 
we didn't kill them all. <laughs> they just disappeared. That's what nature does. They disappear these days at the rate of 25 a day. And I mean regardless of our, our behavior. Irrespective of how we act on this planet, 25 species that were here today will be gone tomorrow. Let them go gracefully. Leave nature alone. Haven't we done enough? We're so self-important. So self-important. Everybody's going to save something now. Save the trees. Save the bees. Save the whales. Save those snails. <laughs> and the greatest arrogance of all, save the planet. What? Are these fucking people kidding me? <laughs> save the planet? We don't even know how to take care of ourselves yet. We haven't learned how to care for one another. We're going to save the fucking planet? I'm getting tired of that shit. Tired of that shit. Tired. I'm tired of fucking Earth Day. I'm tired of these self-righteous environmentalists, these white bourgeois liberals who think the only thing wrong with this country is there aren't enough bicycle paths. People trying to make the world safe for their Volvos. Besides, environmentalists don't give a shit about the planet. They don't care about the planet. Not in the abstract, they don't. Not in the abstract, they don't. You know what they're interested in? A clean place to live their own habitat. They're worried that someday in the future they might be personally inconvenienced. Narrow, unenlightened self-interest doesn't impress me. Besides, there is nothing wrong with the planet. Nothing wrong with the planet. The planet is fine. The people are fucked. <laughs> Difference. Difference. The planet is fine. Compared to the people, the planet is doing great. It's been here four and a half billion years. Did you ever think about the arithmetic? Planet has been here four and a half billion years. We've been here, what, 100,000? Maybe 200,000? And we've only been engaged in heavy industry for a little over 200 years. 200 years versus four and a half billion. And we have the conceit to think that somehow we're a threat? That somehow we're going to put in jeopardy this beautiful little blue-green ball that's just a floating around the sun? The planet has been through a lot worse than us. Been through all kinds of things worse than us. Been through earthquakes, volcanoes, plate tectonics, continental drift, solar flares, sunspots, magnetic storms, the magnetic reversal of the poles, hundreds of thousands of years of bombardment by comets and asteroids and meteors, worldwide floods, tidal waves, worldwide fires, erosion, cosmic rays, recurring ice ages, and we think some plastic bags <laughs> and some aluminum cans are going to make a difference? The planet, the planet, the planet isn't going anywhere. We are. We're going away. Pack your shit, folks. We're going away. And we won't leave much of a trace either. Thank God for that. Maybe a little styrofoam, maybe. Little styrofoam. Planet will be here and we'll be long gone. Just another failed mutation. Just another closed end biological mistake. An evolutionary cul de sac. The planet will shake us off like a bad case of fleas. <laughs> a surface nuisance. <laughs> you want to know how the planet's doing? Ask those people at Pompeii who are frozen into position <laughs> from volcanic ash how the planet's doing. Wonder if the planet's all right? Ask those people in Mexico City or Armenia or a hundred other places buried under thousands of tons of earthquake rubble if they feel like a threat to the planet this week. <laughs> How about those people in Kilauea, Hawaii who build their homes right next to an active volcano and then wonder why they have lava in the living room? <laughs> the planet will be here for a long, long, long Long time after we're gone and it will heal itself it will cleanse itself because that's what it does it's a self-correcting system the air and the water will recover the earth will be renewed and if it's true that plastic is not degradable well the planet will simply incorporate plastic into a new paradigm the earth plus plastic <laughs> the earth doesn't share our prejudice towards plastic plastic came out of the earth the earth probably sees plastic as just another one of its children could be the only reason the Earth allowed us to be spawned from it in the first place. It wanted plastic for itself. <laughs> Didn't know how to make it. Needed us. 
could be the answer to our age-old philosophical question, why are we here? Plastic. Assholes. So, so, the plastic is here, our job is done, we can be phased out now. And I think that's really started already, don't you? I mean, to be fair, the planet probably sees us as a mild threat, something to be dealt with. And I'm sure the planet will defend itself in, in, in the uh, manner of a large organism, like a beehive or an ant colony can muster a defense. I'm sure the planet will think of something. What would you do if you were the planet trying to defend against this pesky, troublesome species? Let's see, what might, hmm, viruses. Viruses might be good. They seem vulnerable to viruses. And uh, viruses are tricky, always mutating and forming new strains whenever a vaccine is developed. Perhaps this first virus could be one that, that compromises the immune system of these creatures, perhaps a human immunodeficiency virus, making them vulnerable to all sorts of other diseases and infections that might come along. And maybe it could be spread sexually, making them a little reluctant to engage in the act of reproduction. Well, that's a poetic note. And it's a start. And I can dream, can I? So don't worry about the little things. Bees, trees, whales, snails. I think we're part of a greater wisdom than we will ever understand. A higher order. Call it what you want. Know what I call it? The big electron. The big electron. Whoa. 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 It doesn't punish. It doesn't reward. It doesn't judge at all. It just is. And so are we. For a little while. Thanks for being here with me for a little while tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, New York City. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. And take care of somebody else. Thank you. Good night.